Colipso Olympiad uh, experiment along with uh, my colleagues from HVCSE. Before I begin, I want to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, uh, Yogita Patel, Mamta, she is here today to help us. My NIUS student Rishi and uh, Hemanj and uh, Professor Bhattacharya, Professor Vijay Singh and Anvesh Majumdar uh, and a lot of a large number of resource person from all over India who has actually helped me in designing some of the experiment time by time I will be I was having conversation with them and that actually helped me in shaping up some of the experiments. So as an educator, we know that there is a noticeable absence of culture of experimentation at a school level. We all know not only at a school level, but also at the college level. Students often lack interest in doing experiments. Uh, you know that they never actually try even some simple experiment which they can do at home to verify some scientific principle. For example, they never drop a ball and see how much time does it take to cover certain height. Also because the numbers are very small, so difficult to measure that. But now with an invent of a smartphone, it is possible. But nevertheless, they never do that. Demonstrations serve a specific purpose, but they have very limited objective. They do not, you know, often they are, it is very difficult to quantify them. They are very good to verify some scientific principle to show in a kind of, you know, magic show kind of thing. But it is often very difficult to quantify them. So in, uh, so what are the reasons and solution, partial solution we can have? One thing is sure there is a lack of motivation and you need infrastructure, you need always a requirement of lab settings to do a proper experiment. Four years back, I was visiting my hometown and this is my school. It is at, uh, it is in Madhya Pradesh. And this is the, these are the photographs when I visited them after 20 years. I was surprised to see they are exactly in the same situation which I, when I left in 1998. This was the, this was the Vigyan Prayogshala Physics Lab. I was not allowed to open it because it opens only once in a year near the exam time. And I did, when I was in 12th, I did only three experiments that time, beauty stone bridge, I think resonance tube and one more potentiometer. They had only those three experiments present even after 20 years, no upgradation at all. You can see one chair is lying on this uh, experimented table and all. And room is dusty and since it was not open, so I climbed upon a window and tried to take a picture and I was soon you know, asked to leave the premises and all. So you can see, this is not the just situation in my hometown. I think it is, if you go to remote places, you will find the same situation in many, many parts of the country. But mobile tools, it has been proved again and again that they offer, uh, they actually, they can be used in increasing the interest, curiosity, and sometimes even the learning achievements. Uh, this, can you, this bottom line is not coming. Yeah, okay, this is good. So there have been a couple of papers which actually claim that using a smartphone as an as an actually teaching tool increases a student's curiosity, interest, and sometimes actually it can also affect their learning outcome. So it's a good thing and the proper research has been done. So what we are trying to do here by using a smartphone, we are trying to address this problem in a very, I will say, this is just a partial solution. We are not claiming that it will, it will revolutionize experimental learning at all. But what we are saying that it is possible to make it widely accessible because now everybody has a smartphone and it is possible to make low cost, not even low cost, some no cost kind of experiment because school do not have uh, any money to buy anything. And we are trying to just bridge the gap between theory and experiment. So what a smartphone can do in a class, it has lots, it has a large number of sensors in it. Uh, it has linear acceleration sensor, it has angular velocity measurement, it can measure in all the directions and it can it can measure intensity of sound, it can measure intensity of light, it, it can measure frequency of sound because basically it is made to hear and transmit your voice. Uh, it also has magnetometer, Hall effect weight based magnetometer sensor. It can also, it also has bar pressure barometer because some high end phone actually nowadays gives you access to barometer. And if you uh, temperature, your smartwatch can actually measure your body temperature and all. Uh, also, I, uh, iOS means iPhone and iPad also have some depth sensor. Keep in mind that not all the sensors have same rate, means refreshing rate in how much, in one second, how much time it will collect the data and all that depends on the functionality. For example, a magnetometer comes with 100 hertz, but light or proximity sensor comes with something like 3 or 4 hertz, that's all. Uh, but 
also that's more if i give you in a smartphone that is not an experiment i give you a sensor what you do out of that sensor actually that's where the creativity lies so you have to design your own experiment just like a hall effect based sensor lying in your lab what you do with that that's what main challenge is so before i begin yeah so this is the outline i'm going to show you a few experiment based on these sensors because we have limited time so i will be showing you some experiment of frequency sensor magnetometer some camera and at the end i will show you some experiment which you can do with phones display and then i will close the talk with i will tell you that how we are promoting this uh, this new way of learning these are the apps i'm going to be I, I will be using if you want you can download it right now and you can play with along with this so let me show you a video first We recorded very recently last week only. I'm trying to see, I'm trying to record how an aeroplane is flying over my head. measure the speed of aeroplane using this video. So this is a question we pose it to the student. So anyway, any anything you want to suggest? Right, very good. Because you could hear as phone was approaching towards you, you could feel the change in the sound and it was approaching you and it was moving away from you. So you can use Doppler shift formula here. So what I'm going to do in the next slide, I'm going to play the video and I will keep, uh, so I have already recorded. I will, I will place the frequency sensor next to it. So it will show you how the frequency is changing, frequency of the sound which it is receiving, how it is changing with as plane is passing by. So right side is the screen recording of the app and left side is the same video you will see. So you can, you can go to VFOX, audio spectrum, change some settings. And the upper part is actually the Fourier transform of the audio signal. And here it is for you in every data point. So at this side. Uh, from here, it was approaching towards you. It was almost over your head here at this point, and then it actually crossed over. So you apply simple formulas which you have learned in higher secondary. There's a plane which is going with a speed v, and at angle at which it is looking at you, that angle is actually phi. The Doppler formula is uh, this one. So you get, instead of just v, you get v cos phi in the denominator. And for some reason, it is not showing. So what you can do here, you can go to VFOX, you can note down these two frequency ranges. I'm sorry, it is, it kept, you know, it keeps it stopping. Yeah, so you need only two data points to calculate aeroplane speed. Why? Because when it is actually far away from you at this side and this side, you can forget that cos phi because that is very small. I will only collect these two data points. One is here, which is 1230 Hertz. And at this point, which is actually 750 Hertz, you put these numbers here and you can approximate the formula to get aeroplane speed, which will come out to be close to, I think, 300 km per hour. Okay, not a bad number because when uh, plane takes off, uh, the speed is approximately between 240 to 280 km per hour. So this is right after the takeoff. Video was taken near Nagpur airport. Uh, so you can see it is actually a pretty decent result, I will say. Now, how do we use this? We give it to the student. Uh, we show them the video and we ask them to calculate the speed and all. A lot of theoretical problems they do on Doppler effect. There are lots of problems in NCRT books. Uh, the couple of problems actually have appeared in prestigious exam also. But in this way, they are seeing something and actually calculating it. So some kind of experimental technique is actually going on in their mind. I want to make it slightly more complicated by involving a situation where this phi angle is changing. So this cos phi will change. 
So then it comes in your mind is circular Doppler effect. So a sound source which is rotating in a circle and you are standing somewhere outside the circle and recording the same thing. So the formula, so they have this cos phi is changing. Now when phi is changing, so frequency responses keep changing. So that's what is expected here. This is the problem which we gave in Olympiad in 2020. Uh, what we told them, ki they, they were given uh, this situation, there is a circular, the sound source moving in a circle and there are two detectors are kept. It is not told you told you where they are kept. And this is the frequency response of the detectors which they are receiving. They were asked to calculate radius of this circle, omega means rotational frequency and the position of the detector. Only thing they were given is this the speed of sound 340 meter per second. My apologies for using bad symbols here. C is the speed of sound here. Uh, almost 60% of a student wrote that the smaller response where the maximum frequency is smaller, it is for the source which is nearer to the sorry, it is for the detector which is nearer to the source. And the uh, my apologies again, this is the detector for which is close closer to the source, and this is this is for the detector which is away from the source. But now I'm going to show you the video. So we uh, we can actually do this by uh, by playing. Uh, yes, I'm just going to show you a demo. Uh, let it be. So I will use tone generator here. So by phone you can use you can actually generate constant frequency of sound. Do you feel the change? Okay, so you can keep again the same frequency detector next to it and you can record that. So for a controlled experiment, we went to a playground and on a merry-go-round, we tied this sound source, which is actually due to, due to the speaker. So from this, we supplied constant uh, frequency of sound and on the, and then we will record this frequency response here. Mamta is going to actually put the phone inside the circle and she is going to take it. It was surprising for, for the student to see that in the circle, the detector is right inside and outside, the frequency responses are different, means the highest frequency and the lowest frequency. Now to calculate anything out of this response, I need only this upper frequency and the lower frequency, minimum and maximum frequency. Because omega, I can always calculate by calculating the distance between these two peaks that will give me omega or the frequency of rotation. So by, uh, by doing this, you know, you can always move your finger across this app and you can calculate this. So this is the minimum frequency 397. This is, yeah, this is the Ordino Science Channel. This is not FeeFox, this is Ordino Science Channel. Reason is that Science Channel actually gives you some connected data points. It plots actually in line plot and FeeFox gives you just data points. So for visualization purpose, this is actually pretty decent app. So uh, you can see that maximum frequency was 4018 hertz and this is 3977 hertz. Now you have got two equations and you have only two unknowns, R and actually F naught and omega. Uh, so omega actually you calculate by looking at the distance between these two peaks or three peaks for a better, uh, I will say averaging it out. And we gave 4,000 4, hertz and by putting these numbers here, you can get 3997 hertz, pretty decent number again. And R, you can go to Anushakti Nagar, you can see. So there's a Rimjim Park where we actually carried out this exercise. So R is actually 67 centimeter, we measured it by tape. From here, you get 63 centimeter because our speaker was not ex exactly at the boundary. It was somewhere slightly off from that. Now, this problem was turned out to be very challenging because it always surprises them why this thing will change. And also Doppler shift, they do not usually actually calculate in a lab. Okay, But for the even this, an example which is very rich in physics, people use it in astronomy, people use it in radar and many other things. Something which they can do just at their home, it always surprises them. So I'll move away from Doppler now. There are lots of you know uh, other experiments with Doppler you can do. You can calculate acceleration due to gravity. Just start this uh, constant tone generator, drop it, 
and then you can calculate acceleration due to gravity also. Or you can move it on an inclined plane and exercise is same. Okay, so this is the experiment, at least this I did in my, when I was uh, in my higher secondary. Uh, so this is called resonance tube experiment. So what happens here, there is a, this one tube in which some water label is filled <clears throat> and there is a tuning fork, fork here and you hit the tuning fork and you know that you are creating vibrations in the medium and only certain frequencies can survive in this, in this tube. So when the frequencies which can survive in this matches with the tuning fork frequency, you hear some louder sound, which is called resonance. So using this, actually you can calculate the speed of sound. You just need to calculate that at which level you have, uh, you found this resonance and then you multiply by, uh, yeah, tuning for frequency and you can calculate this. So it is an a standard exercise. But with a smartphone, you don't need a tuning for. As I said, you can always supply some constant frequency from outside. So there is a pipe here, instead of pipe, you can just take, instead of water filled pipe, you can take just another pipe and do the same thing here. On other side, in Science Journal or the FIFOX app, you can measure the sound pressure level, which actually measure the sound intensity. So wherever the frequency is highest, you will see a peak or for other frequencies, the intensity will be lowered on. Uh, when Arno shows his uh, Rubens tube experiment, he's actually using the same principle. Okay, so this is the Rubens tube, fire waves and all. At one side, he's supplying some constant frequency, uh, let's say fifth or sixth harmonics, and depending upon that, you can see these pressure uh, nodes and anti nodes. So we can repeat the same thing. Actually, we did this. Uh, what we did that we supplied, I think, uh, seventh or eighth harmonics on one side. We took his Rubens tube and scanned the sound intensity level along the length of the Rubens tube. And you can see very nicely, you can see this, uh, these drops here. So wherever there is a pressure node, there will be sound uh, intensity anti node. And wherever there is pressure anti node, you will see node other way around. So a nice visualization of what you see in the textbook, you can actually see it. Uh, right in your hand. But you don't even need Rubens tube. I'm going to give you a very simple experiment. So this is the bucket bath experiment. Every day in the morning when you take bucket bath, morning or evening, whenever you want. Uh, so uh, you start the water tap and you can see that when water is being filled up in the bucket, uh, an astute listener will, will be always able to realize when, when, your water, when your bucket is filled without even looking at the water. Okay, so how do you do that? You actually, you are using the same principle. So water is splashing the surface of water, which is already filled. You are creating vibrations in the medium and only certain frequencies can survive. Now that frequency will keep changing because your water level is changing. So you will, you will feel the change in the frequency. Okay, so as water level is filled up, air column length is changed and that's, that's what will dictate your frequencies which can survive in this medium. So now I'm going to show you a video here again. So uh, the same app, I'm going to use audio spectrum app here, which I used actually in the previous uh, demonstration. And on right hand side, and we don't have bucket, but we will be using some cylinder and then we are filling water. And you will see the frequencies, which actually we can see here. So these lines, this is the fundamental frequency. But this F, this F gives you a facility to see other harmonics as well. For example, this is third harmonic, this is fifth, seventh, and ninth. If you look at the Fourier transform, you can see actually even more. You can actually see even this side nicely arrange these frequency graphs, you can see. Okay, so this is also a very good exercise for the student because you can see many other harmonics. And tuning fork, you are only using fundamental harmonics. But with this, you can see almost everything. Now, your job is to export this data. And uh, yeah, so now the equation for this, which I showed you in the previous slide, L will have also have this water flow rate with this because as water flow rate means the with the time, this L is actually decreasing. So the air column length is changing here. 
You can export this data, you can plot one over frequency versus time, you can linearize this process and it should give you a straight line if your flow rate is constant and you can easily calculate the speed of sound. So we got pretty decent result for every harmonic you can plot a data point here. So even a simple exercise can lead to very small research project for the students. And we became actually adventurous. We put a hot air blower at the top. We try to heat up the air. And as this is heating up, so it means the speed of sound should keep increasing. So if you do this, we actually yeah. So you can see that as you are increasing the heat air blower temperature, you can see the shift in the intercept. The intercept tells you what is the speed of sound. OK? Yeah. So what I wanted to tell you that even a very simple experiment can give you very rich physics and a small research kind of project here. I will move away from now uh, frequency sensor. I want to take you to the magnetometer sensor, which is a Hall effect based sensor in your phone. Uh, you can use it to measure dipole movement, quarter dipole movement, etc., by making combination of uh, uh, magnets here, or you can use it as a tracker. You can, uh, in a pendulum, in a state of pendulum bob, you can just put a small magnet there, and you can it can actually simply record these kind of uh, waveform here. So it actually tells you. You can easily calculate here time period, etc. Very accurate time period measurements can be done using magnetometer. So this is not actually directly uh, a measurement of magnetic field here in this kind of tracking management, but just by looking at peak, you can figure it out. But I want to give you another experiment here, which actually we gave it for actually ninth class student. And let's see this. So this is the G measurement, acceleration due to gravity measurement using magnetometer as a timer. So photo gate timer, which you use in your labs, what it does when something is dropping and by calculating that how much time it has taken between two photo gates, that's how you calculate any velocity or acceleration. Here, I'm going to use magnetometer as a magneto gate. So you find uh, some Almera or something where you have some three cells available. You can keep two phones at these two bottom levels. And uh, why I'm using these cells? Because so that your distance measurement will become slightly easier here. And you take a magnet. And whenever the magnet is going to cross this phone, it will give you a peak in the magnetic field. So that will indicate that what time magnet has crossed the phone. So I will drop this magnet from, from rest. At this point, its speed is V. And as it is going down, let's say it is crossing this phone at T1. This At this phone, at this phone it is crossing at T2. So now you have delta T in your hand. You already know the distance between these two levels here. And you can eliminate this velocity using this distance between first and second self. And it will give you ex uh, acceleration due to gravity. The problem is, how do you synchronize the phone? OK, because you will start no. Uh, so, so at this phone, and these two phones has to start at the same time if you want to calculate this delta t here. So what you do, you keep them on the same level and drop the magnet. Now magnet is going to cross at the magnet is going to cross both the phone at the same time. So the first peak which you get in magnetic field versus time graph, which should be here somewhere. Yeah. So this indicates that phone has started here. So keep that maintained, put it on the self, drop the magnet, and then you keep noting down where the first. So this is the first drop. This is the second drop, third drop. You can repeat it as many as time you want. So distance between these two peaks. And this tend between these two peaks, if you subtract this, that should be delta t here. OK? So uh, actually, we get pretty decent result with these things for acceleration due to gravity. We always get between 9.6 to 9, between 10 meter per second square. Yeah. Sampling rate. For my, yes. So this is 100 hertz. For magnetometer, actually, depending upon your phone, it can be 150, 200 hertz also. Because the navigation actually requires very higher sampling rate for magnetometer. You cannot repeat this with light or even the audio because their sampling rate is less than actually one sorry less than 10. Yeah, you can also place the magnets over the cells and drop the phone but why you want to drop the phone when <laughs> an option of you dropping the magnet is available okay uh, in that case actually you will not have this difficulty of synchronizing okay because phone will uh, phone you you only have to switch on phone only once so then you don't have any problem with that over the camera sensor. Now, uh, for the camera sensor, I have chosen one experiment, which I think uh, you might relate to. Yes, it's, yeah. So I think I'm sure that everybody has done this exercise whenever you want to check at home whether your remote control is working or not. You use CCD of the camera. So you start remote and look, look through the camera. 
you don't have to take the photograph because CCDs of the camera is actually sensitive to IR wavelength, uh, uh, at, at least certain IR wavelengths here. So this actually, when I'm looking at it, so we took this picture and you can see that remote is working here. So because remote actually uses IR frequency range. Now you have got a source remote control. You have got a sensor which it can detect, which is your phone. You can do lots of experiment with this. For example, we have done uh, this grating experiment. So you can see diffraction of IR. So what we are going to do here, there's a TV remote here. We are going to put some uh, grating with some certain spacing here. And then you look through the camera. Okay, we have got the setup here. You can have a look at it at the end. And yeah, so you can see these nice fringes you are getting here. Okay, so if you know this D here, spacing of grating spacing, capital D distance between a screen and your source, it is very easy to calculate uh, wavelength of this. Yeah, let's I don't know why this coming. Yeah, so by using D lambda over D formula, depending upon which uh, number of fringes you are looking, it is very easy to calculate IR wavelength. For this particular setup, we got around uh, 10, I think, uh, 3, 4 nanometer. Uh, actual number is, I think, close to 980 or 940 nanometer. So if we take this, you know, uh, this picture very carefully, I think we will hit that number also. So with camera now, so this is one thing, but uh, uh, yeah, so I think in next slide, probably I should be able to tell you more users about that. Now, the experiments using phones display, this is not related to any sensors which we are going to use, but the properties of display we are going to study here. So motivation for this experiment was uh, a famous historical experiment done by Rosalind Franklin. And she was the first one to obtain X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA. There are lots of history involved in this story. So you, may, you might want to check it out if you don't know about this. Rosalind Franklin, so she gave this picture in one of the colloquiums. She actually presented this picture, which is called photo 51 experiment. Photo 51, sorry. Uh, so this is the X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA. Now this X here, is the signature helical structure. So whenever you have an helix, you want to take the diffraction pattern, it will give you some kind of X pattern here. And after these two dots, you can see one dot is missing here, then again it is starting. So these actually indicate that DNA is slightly offset against each other, it means it is actually a double helical structure is there in DNA. So this actually started the discovery of DNA helical structure. So we are playing with a smartphone display. What we are doing, we are just shining the light on the display and trying to see what nice pattern we get. Uh, so these are the pattern we got with some different phones here. You can see some kind of diffraction pattern it was generating. So obviously there is some kind of uh, reflection grating is there in your phone, which is actually making, uh, which is giving you such nice diffraction pattern. So intrude and we put this phone's display under the microscope and you can see some nicely arranged red, green and blue. Uh, color pixels in your phone. So depending upon what geometry you have, whether you have AMOLED screen or you have got LED screen and all that. So the diffraction pattern will decide that. Now with one of the phones, we got this pattern. Okay, can we show it? Switch of lights. All lights, all lights, including the screen. Okay. You can see barely here. Can you see this X here? The slightly displaced these two arms of X here like this. So this is the pattern which we saw. And now you can switch off. This was already on, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is the pattern we got. Now for obvious reason, it uh, brought back memories of X pattern here. Uh, we thought that there's something here which is actually giving you this kind of pattern. So we put the screen under the microscope again, and we saw some wavy kind of uh, pixels here. And we looked carefully, this is the structure it has. Okay, in 2015, when I came here to talk in asset colloquium, actually I presented 2015 International Physics Olympiad experiment because that year India hosted it. And we actually mimicked this. So we gave students some kind of you know, 2D structure, which is a lithography etched uh, on a plate. And this kind of structure will also give you this kind of X pattern here. So for a 3D structure, we gave them a 2D grating 
which could give you similar pattern here. So we wanted to tell a student that how you can actually understand the diffraction of DNA. You don't need actually helical pattern. You can actually put X on the plate and it will give you X pattern in the diffraction. So again, that uh, uh, increased our curiosity. Now the challenge was that how to make sense of how to connect these two things here. Some kind of quantification is required here. Only then you will be satisfied. So you can see many length scale here. Uh, yeah, so let me show you. So we could figure out there is some uh, what are so what we are going to actually see this is the, this is working as a reflection grating. So we are looking at any length scale which is present which can give you some kind of diffraction pattern. That's what we are looking at. So one is actually distance between these two subpixels. So one R is actually called subpixel and RGB is called pixel here. So this is one area of pixel here, area of pixel here. Distance between these two is actually I'm going to call it B and distance between two subpixels is H and, this, and length of one pixel is G and thickness of this pixel is A and so on. And double length is actually 2N, 2L. So it was actually not an easy task for us because uh, it was similar to what what was done 50 years back. Okay, not as difficult as that, but you just need to look at the pattern, find out how many periodicities are there and try to make sense of it. Okay, so for months, we actually just stared at the pattern because we could not figure it out what is going on here. But then we started it, looking at it. See, you can see this is first fringes. Okay, this is the smallest fringes you, which you are seeing here. And you know that fringe width will be inversely proportional to slit width. So let's call it this. So this will give you two way. So this distance here is actually giving you this fringes here. Now the next one is actually half of it. Okay, means a double in the diffraction pattern, but half in the length here. So this is A here. Okay, and then what are the other periodicities here? So you have to find out the pattern which actually repeating after certain length here. So one is here, the distance between this area and this area. This is actually can be, can correspond to this G, length of the total pixel here. Then more, uh, this is B here, you can see after every four, this four, five are getting repeated. Okay, <clears throat> one more is left, which is actually, I'm sure you must have figured it out. It is this. So on these X arm, we have got one, two, three, four, five, six fringes here, six layer, layers of fringes. Then again, it is getting repeated. Okay, and then last one is left is angle alpha. Okay, so I'm sure there will be one or two things are still left. We are still, you know, trying to figure it out if there is some information which we have missed. Uh, but what I want to tell you that you don't need to go to a very sophisticated lab to do this kind of ex diffraction experiment. Grating is right there in your phone. Okay, whatever diffraction pattern you are getting, you are trying to see that you can actually take a very high resolution photograph from another phone of your display. And what I saw under the microscope, you can actually not see very good picture, but some bare minimum picture you can get from any high resolution photograph also. But this was not all about it. Uh, certain extension is also possible here. These two dots, this one dot which you are seeing here, this is not just one dot. There is one more dot is here. Okay, and we found out that as you are changing the angle of this laser, the distance between these two dots we are changing. So whenever this is happening, obviously some kind of reflection property is involved here. So after you know doing some calculation, we figured out that one dot is actually for reflection from the bottom surface and one is from the top surface. So just by looking at at what angle, how this distance between these two dots are changing with angle, we could figure out what is the length of this top touch glass of your phone, which comes out to be depending upon phone. Um, our phone gives you something like one millimeter. Okay. And iPad screen, it is actually slightly on higher side because it, they have got a thicker glass there. And the last extension of this can be is possible is, uh, yeah. So if you put a small water drop on your phone, very small water drop, uh, and what you will see actually some grid kind of pattern there. Now you know what that grid kind of pattern can be. These are actually magnified images of the pixel of your phone. Okay, so now you have got instead of that huge optical bench apparatus which you use in your schools. So now you have an object which is below the touch glass, magnified image which is right here, and you have got a plano convex lens in for in term in form of water drop. Okay, so object, lens, and its image. Only challenge is how to measure these tiny distances. 
okay object distance you can easily calculate by calculating number of pixels in per unit area so you go to website and find out what is the ppi of certain font pixel per inch so that will tell you what is the distance between these two pixels but the distance between one line is actually distance between magnified images of the pixel so what we do we actually take picture from uh, phone and put it under image j and then we see that so image is actually image processing software from which you can measure very tiny distances like this in terms of the pixels. Okay, so that makes our job easier here. So three optics experiment, I will say again, rich in physics, you can do very easily with your phone. So this was all about display properties. Now I'm almost at the end of my talk. I want to tell you how we are actually making it, you know, popularization, how we are doing this. So lots of workshop we have done in last uh, three years, whenever there's a teacher workshop or we get opportunity to meet students. Uh, we show them these kind of experiments, we make them do certain experiments and all. We also have some WhatsApp group of teachers, something like 400 teachers are associated with us. Whenever we have an idea or teachers have an idea, they just put it in the group. So that's how we are actually doing it. We are minimum kind of thing which we are doing. Uh, but at the same time, we are also putting them in uh, national level exams, which we organize. Omni Bhava Center is actually nodal engines for Olympiad. So certain number of problems, for example, in 2021, we put this speed of sound measurement, the magnetometer, ma magnetometer is a magneto gate. And uh, then again, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so this is the verification of Snellstrom. means last year, the water drop experiment, which we gave in physics Olympiad, uh, in elastic collision, that is also a very nice problem. You drop a ball and you calculate coefficient of friction, et cetera, just by using phone. And the circular Doppler effect and magnet in a pipe, this is also assisted with some simulation here. All these problems are located. You can just scan this QR code and uh, then you can read about these things. What is important here that each problem is also kind of manual for doing experiments. So some authentic data is there. It's not some idealized version of some theoretical problem, not idealized version of some experiment, proper data which we have captured from, captured from a smartphone screen. You put that in their in their exam. So a student actually, when they are attempting this problem, they are doing some kind of actual data analysis. They are learning and they can actually verify those things by going at home and repeating the same thing. And again, we are sort of you know bridging the gap between theory and experiment. And one more experience I want to share with you. In uh, so last year in 2020, I happened to be in Bihar. Uh, someone invited me to uh, do a workshop in one of the remotest places, actually Professor Vijay Singh, who is here at the center, he invited me. So this is proper village, means they have very bad quality of roads, only one or two teachers will be in a school. And this is their school, you can see this. And uh, uh, so I tried to show lots of smartphone experiments there, but then I realized one more problem. Uh, it was the problem of language, like medium of instruction, because I was telling them in Hindi, but phone app is actually in English. And students actually were not able to understand what to do with that. So uh, fortunately, after a few months, um, Arno was visiting, Arno was meeting with creators of FIFOX in Germany. And from there, we got an idea that we can translate this app in local languages. So we, we could translate this app. And I'm happy to share the news that this year, just two months back, the final Hindi version also appears in FIFOX. Currently, Tamil translation is going on. Telugu translation is also going on. So I'm hoping that uh, this will be available for the public next year. So the, uh, the crowd is very small who is going to use this in regional languages. And also, it's a big challenge that how to translate something very technical in, in the local language. For example, what are you going to call data history? OK, or uh, acoustic stopwatch. OK, so a different kind of challenge is there. But we could do something with that. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that people will get benefit from that. Even if, let's say, one school is going to use it, we will assume that it's actually worth doing that. So uh, if any of you wants to contribute to this translation, please contact me. Okay, Any language you want to do, we can facilitate it with you, Sebastian Stocks, of who has actually created this FIFOX app. So that's all. Uh, yeah, I want to close with uh, yeah, one last thing I want to show you. So actually, things are moving very fast. People have made a spectrophotometer. This is digital diffraction experiment, very tiny di digital diffraction kit, which comes with the, uh, with the phone. It's very cheap. It comes, I think, in not more than 2,000, 3,000 rupees. You can do lots of experiment with this. So what do they do? Actually, they, uh, so they capture the images on their phone and uses, again, image uh, processing software, et cetera, to do that. You can make very tiny spectrophotometer. You need only a grating and one box. 
and again image processing and color picker app will help you in recognizing what is the pattern is giving it to you but most amazing thing which i have found is use in the medical science so this branch is called phonocardiography this paper was published in physics teachers so from physics to the medical science how they are carrying these people made a stethoscope so imagine that you are let us say 100 meter away from 100 kilometers away from your doctors and you feel some kind of discomfort and you want to tell your doctor that this is happening and doctor will tell you i need to look at your i need to check your heart beat and all so how do you do this it's very simple to make nowadays actually you don't have 3.5 mm jack but uh, this paper from 5 years back so you take headphone and put some kind of spacer at the mic part of the phone so just it need, needs to have some kind of distance from your heart okay and put it near to your heart and can actually record your heart beat let me show how if i can actually play this file so this is actually be recorded of one of our colleague we don't realize that but in some part of the world some part of india actually this is going to be very useful uh, one more story related to this so this heartbeat when we recorded it was our uh, colleague yogitas and uh, So we tried to count that how many heartbeats actually in this dhum dhum from this humming sound. We tried to count the heartbeat of this uh, from this audio device, and every time I was finding it is hundred and ten, hundred and fifteen, and it was a resting heartbeat. So I thought maybe I did something wrong. I don't know that much of experimental or medical physics. So I sent it to my friend, and he immediately said this person is suffering from hypertension. She so needs to get it checked, and she got her blood pressure checked, and it was actually elevated. So some small thing actually came out of this. later these people actually made some pocket ecg from using same headphone so they tore apart uh, uh, this is the headphone to the phone part they tore it apart from mic they took two wires and they connected two electrodes using this we all know this our body produces electric signals when it is beating so they are actually recording from this app which is called think labs app by using very simple kind of conductor here so they also put some kind of you know uh, Salted solution so that some conductivity is increased and all, and uh, then you can record this. Unfortunately, now uh, it doesn't come because uh, nowadays you don't get three point five uh, mmJ. But I'm sure some kind of this kind of version will be surely in market in next one or two years. Some pocket ECG will be in your pocket. Okay. So uh, that's all, and these are some of the references. Uh, now we have got some time. Can I demonstrate something here? I will need your help. you want to take any questions first yes sure if you have yes uh, yeah so uh, i'm sure there are lot more interesting stuff uh, tab tak kar lete hain to be experienced but uh, if there are some questions let it be very brief and uh, a few because then we can spend a little bit more time here are there any questions any questions from a uh, zoom or youtube Uh, Zoom, of course, you can just uh, unmute yourself and start asking questions. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't see any questions, surprisingly. So uh, we will start them. Just yeah. Yeah. Oh. Huh? Okay. Ah. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, can I ask the question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. so uh, very nice talk uh, mr patel uh, beautiful uh, just fantastic uh, i just wanted to ask you what are the uh, i mean this you showed uh, about four examples of uh, things that you could do with a smartphone uh, typically how many more do you have uh, let's say a couple of orders of magnitude more than this uh, actually uh, uh, frankly tell you so if you just don't count my contribution we have developed something like 30 experiments okay A minimal setup you can do, but there are more than eight hundred papers published in last decade oh. on use of a smartphone in physics. This I am talking about only physics journals. There will be more in chemistry and biology. So uh, things are moving very fast. I will say. No, for instance, this magnetometer with a uh, sensor which is there that could be used very fruitfully. You know, to find things with, uh, you know ores which have different magnetization and so on, or but, even uh, testing the you know the dependence radial dependence if you have a current in a wire. and you know maybe a helmholtz coil and so on very nice that you can do such things uh, with a smartphone beautiful 
So whatever uh, demos. Fifox yeah. So if, if you if you go to Fifox Fifox website, yeah. and, uh, they have got lots of demos on their YouTube channel. They have some inbuilt experiments actually okay. already integrated in the lab itself. But yeah. your magnetometer is actually very versatile app. Yeah. So, uh, whatever name you have taken, Helmut Coil and all, all those yeah. things actually have been done and they have been published as a paper also. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Uh, one more thing I want to add that most of the papers which have been published in this uh, physics education journal, they're from teachers and students. So yeah. lots of opportunities are there. Uh, you don't need to be a very serious, serious researcher like what you do here. But even even a school level teachers can do lots of, you know, small research projects and publish that. We can talk about the non-serious ones like the pressure sensor in the aircraft. Yeah. Yeah, so what are now is saying that... Uh, uh, okay, so uh, if you have a Google Pixel or an iPhone with a pressure sensor, there are some very nice experiments you can do. Yeah, so uh, so what we did that uh, uh, an airplane toilet. So I carried my phone, and every time you press that, whoosh, that time you can switch on your pressure sensor. You can see that suddenly it drops, and it comes back to the same level. And again, you press it. So I kept doing it for five ten minutes. <laughs> So we have got some nice uh, pattern here. I Usually I do these kind of things, send it to these people, figure it out what is going on. One more thing, uh, so a couple of days back, uh, so you can keep pressure sensor here. And you must have noticed that uh, in your house, if you have got windows on other side of the wall, so when you open the door, you feel some kind of shuttering of the windows. You can keep your pressure sensor there. And immediately you will see this door is open and you will see the increase in the pressure because air has been pushed up to the wall. To the window side and you can see some nice you know peak as soon as door is opened and then again it will settle down again when somebody opens so you can do all these kind of funny things i usually uh, keep my phone on for many occasions whenever i'm jumping running and we are on bouncy or anything we do all these kind of things here so i want to demonstrate uh beats here first we we'll just do one one glass yes uh, first, just one glass. We will measure this. So this is just an app that allows you to see the phone display uh, on the computer. Just a minute. Hey, turn on. Just a minute. Okay, so uh, I'm using audio spectrum. And first, we are going to check the frequency generated as Arno is moving his finger on the wine glass and whatever the frequency is this. Enough. Yeah. So you can see this is 1078. By the way, same frequency can be also produced but just by hitting it. So when you hit it, so why this glass actually vibrates. Oh, <laughs> You can see it's the same kind of frequency. So whenever you're rubbing your finger, it's the same frequency, or you hit it, it's the same frequency. Now this is the other glass. So this is one one zero one. Okay. So one is one zero seven eight hertz, other is eleven hundred. Sorry. 110 yeah, hertz. So the difference between them is uh, something like 30 hertz. Now when you are now when you are playing these two frequencies together, two nearby frequencies, what you should observe? Beats. Okay, so we are going to go show you the visualization of those beats. So if you collect at this time uh, audio amplitude, so you it should show you some kind of you know increasing and decreasing frequencies kind of sorry, amplitude, not frequencies. Uh, is it on? Yeah. So what you can do here for the students, you don't tell them what are the frequencies here. If they understand beat phenomena very well, you can check the distance between, sorry, 
time difference between these two peaks here from here to here from this point to this point so this is like bigger envelope and the inside one so just check the time difference between these two so by doing reverse calculation they will tell us what are the frequencies of these wine glass here uh, similar thing you can do by uh, by by hitting a rod so because this also has got some characteristic frequency so if you this thing It's a matter of practicing so that we don't talk. <laughs> I mean, wine glasses are not standard lab. <laughs> it depends at what stage of your session. Also, it's filled with water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was uh, explaining with this that uh, so uh, same resonance tube kind of experiment you can carry out with a rod. You, if you hit it from one side, okay, so this is some humming sound which you hear. That is again by the, the certain frequency which it can sustain in this medium. If I place my hand somewhere else, you will not hear that harmonics because now that's a third. I don't know why there's an echo. So that's a third here. So by noting down what frequency this is, and you go to your uh, Google, find out what is uh, young modulus and all, what is the density of this, you can find out the speed of sound in this medium, which actually gives you pretty accurate result here. So I think this is all. If you want to see those water drop lens, you can come here, I will show you. We also have got uh, diffraction by the IR spectra. So that also we have if you want to see. So you can come here and see that I, we cannot display here. We have a tube with the, we can do the ports. We can display IR diffraction as well. Okay, yeah, okay. This we can display, he says. Lights needs to be switched up. Yeah, we need to switch up the lights. Chale gaye, paanch baje gaye. Paanchu. Yeah, you can see these two dots next to this bigger dot. Yeah, because he has kept actually very close to the grating. That's why this distance is very <coughs> small here. Yeah. So these are the interference fringes by diffraction fringes by infrared. Yeah. So I think this is all from my side. For water drop, you will have to come here you, because you have not. If you can purchase asking you to repeat what are the apps that you mentioned. Yeah. These apps are. Can you type it in the. Achha, they will not be able to see this. These apps are. I can. I can. Yeah, but it's just better type it in the chat. Yeah, you can YouTube type it, not on Zoom. These are your two apps. Arduino was the, actually originally developed by Google, uh, but uh, now it is it has gone to Ardi Sorry. Yeah, it has gone to Arduino now. <clears throat> Originally, it used to be called Google Science General. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Satyana. Okay. So we want to thank uh, the speaker for beautifully demonstrating some really, really nice, cool uh, physics experiment, but using handheld devices like cell phone. So I'm sure we will do much more interesting work in the future. We all want to uh, thank you, and both you and all your team members. And we also want to come back and give uh, much different and maybe new I will try to. Thank you so thank much. You, so please join for a cup of tea in the canteen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.